Hi, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to discuss the ninth and last chapter of Thomas Metzinger's book, The Ego Tunnel. The advancements in neuroscience have not only deepened our understanding of the human brain, but have also introduced powerful new ways to alter our experiences. We now have the capability to manipulate our brain functions and experiences in ways that were previously unimaginable. This includes everything from inducing artificial blind spots in our vision to triggering religious or mystical experiences through electromagnetic stimulation. Simply put, experiences that were once thought to be deeply personal or even spiritual can now be recreated in a lab. But this raises important questions. If our most profound experiences can be artificially induced, what does that say about their authenticity? In this final chapter, Metzinger dives into the risks associated with the ongoing consciousness revolution and he identifies potentials for action. Let's explore what this all means for us as individuals and as a society. We are at the brink of a new era where neurotechnology might soon allow us to design our own experiences. Imagine being able to choose how you feel or even what kind of consciousness you want to experience at any given moment. This could range from altering our mood and cognitive abilities to inducing states of spiritual awe or deep emotional connection. The most immediate application is in the field of cognitive enhancement. We already have substances like Ritalin and Modafinil being used off-label to boost focus and productivity. And it's not just about treating illnesses anymore, it's about enhancing the abilities of healthy people. A significant percentage of professionals, including scientists, have already used these substances not for medical reasons, but to gain a competitive edge. In this chapter, Metzinger goes on a tangent about all kinds of substances and cognitive enhancers. He pleads not only for the need to regulate the use of such means politically, but also for the need to reconsider the ethics of the use of such substances. The question that arises is no longer just is this or that substance illegal, but is this state of consciousness to be deemed illegal? Should we allow people to enhance their cognitive and emotional states? If so, where do we draw the line? Should students be tested for cognitive enhancers before exams? What happens if mood optimizers become so common that sadness or irritability are seen as personal failings? The broader question here is about autonomy and freedom. Should individuals have the right to alter their minds as they see fit? And should there be limits on what kind of altered states are permissible? As these technologies and substances improve, we will need a robust and nuanced neuroethical framework to guide us. So as usual, I'm going to give you a couple of excerpts for each um, segment that just kind of corroborates what I've been um, summarizing so far. So to start off, we have three statements. Um, one of the new keywords in the important new academic discipline of neuroethics is cognitive enhancement. Soon we will be able to enhance cognition and mood in healthy subjects. Indeed, cosmetic psychopharmacology has already arrived on the scene. And mind you, this book was written in 2009, so that's uh, 14 or 15 years ago now. So whenever he speaks of today and stuff, we <laughs> just remember that this book is 14 years old. Today we have a legal market and, a, and an illegal market. Thus, there are legal states of consciousness and illegal states of consciousness. If we manage to introduce an intelligent drug policy, the goal should be to minimize damage to individual consumers and to society while maximizing potential gains. Modern neuroethics will have to create a new approach to drug policy. The question is which brain state should be legal? Which regions of phenomenal state space, if any, should be declared off limits? If you consider the 
fentanyl crisis in the US uh, right now, um, we should probably ask the question which uh, drugs are being weaponized um, by adversary states. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not um, suggesting anything here. I'm just sort of um, considering that drugs, I mean, they always have been, I guess, but can also be misused to, um, to uh, bas basically attack states on a, um, on a whole other level. This leads us to the emerging field of neuroethics. Neuroethics isn't just about the impact of these technologies on individual users, but also about how they affect society as a whole. Imagine a future where cognitive enhancers and emotional regulators are widespread. Would we need to redefine what is considered acceptable behavior in the workplace, at home, or even in our religious practices? We must ask ourselves, what is a good state of consciousness? Should society decide or should individuals be free to explore altered states on their own? We've seen how restrictive drug policies have failed to control the demand for altered states of consciousness. And with new neurotechnological tools, these challenges will only intensify. Here we have we also have three statements. Um, neuroethics is important, but it is not enough by itself. I propose a new branch of applied ethics, consciousness ethics. In traditional ethics, we ask what is a good action. Now we must also ask what is a good state of consciousness. The ego tonal evolved, and this is a longer one, but I feel it's important because it sort of ties back to um, the, the contents of the whole book, really especially the concept of the ego tunnel. The ego tunnel evolved as a biological system of representation and information processing that is part of a social network of communicating ego tunnels. Now we find ourselves caught in the midst of a dense mesh of technical systems of representation and information processing. With the advent of radio, television and the internet, the ego tunnel became embedded in a global data cloud characterized by rapid growth, increasing speed and an autonomous dynamic of its own. It dictates the pace of our lives, it enlarges our social environment in an unprecedented manner, it has begun to reconfigure our brains which are desperately trying to adapt to this new jungle, the information jungle and ecological niche unlike any we have ever in inhabited. For those of us intensively working with it, the internet has already become a part of our self-model. We use it for external memory storage as a cognitive prosthesis and for emotional auto-regulation. We, th we think with the help of the internet and it assists us in determining our desires and goals. Now, I just had a conversation with uh, in in the in my workplace with with a guy who's in the, he's in the thir his third year of his apprenticeship um so he does a stint in our department and we are currently i'm currently working on programming um some chatbots for research purposes and other marketing purposes and he showed interest, so we, we got talking and um, the topic of, you know, using ChatGPT for academic reasons came up, so. Um, and he basically, I mean, confirmed that, you know, most students um, are already using ChatGPT to create their um, their thesis papers and whatnot. And we also agreed that even if you even if you didn't invest time to program your own chatbot for that sort of purpose and you just sort of bought an app or something, the thinking about what you want to say, you know, the whole co having the concept, having the idea searching for literature, I mean, you can find that that's still on you, you know, you still have to 
be sort of like the driving force be- behind your thesis and you still have to understand what you're doing. So, I mean, hopefully people still do. Um, but then uh, the, the question also came up how much universities should be regulating the use of chat GPT. And, and I was just saying, you know, it's almost like when the, I mean, I was around when the internet came up and when people started Googling and stuff. So it's almost like <laughs> banning Google, you know, <laughs> back in the day, which is uh, absolutely impossible. So we will have to find our way to integrate and work with and interface with these technologies, you know, in a, in a way that is not just going to to take the example of, of a university paper, not just give to give us a, a passing grade, but use it responsibly and in a way that sort of le- alleviates you from the, I don't know, hour long literature search using, uh, <laughs> using some kind of cardboard catalog. I mean, those are things that, that, that you and I probably um, still remember doing, but then gaining time, you know, saving time, having ChatGPT help you with those kinds of things. And in the, in, on the other hand, you have time to really think about and, and further develop your concept as you go along. So um, what I noticed is, I mean, obviously I, I, I use ChatGPT for private purposes as well. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm having it help me here and there. But I, I, I noticed that I sort of feel strange when I, you know, it, it's almost like there is a, to me anyway, there is almost like a barrier, you know, where I'll have it help me so much, but the rest I want to do by myself. So I, it's almost like there's a natural boundary. I mean, for me anyway, to a, a natural moral or ethical boundary that I wouldn't cross. So, um, even if I was able to program a chat GPT so that it would write a whole thesis for me from start to finish, I probably wouldn't, I, w- I would never do that because it wouldn't feel right. I, I wouldn't feel right in terms of it's not my baby anymore. You know, I, I, I mean, so, so I think what I'm trying to say is that I think, and that probably depends on what generation you are, you know, but I think there's a natural sort of, built-in type of minimal morals, I suppose, that with the advent of any new technology, um, I think it's it's almost like a built-in mechanism that we are sort of cautious and careful. And I personally, I mean, I see the need to regulate a lot of these things on a, let's say, state or even international or level. But then I, I would rather us develop a sort of consciousness <laughs> that that already includes a um, set of basic morals and, and I would rather us enhance that sort of culture of consciousness you know um, which obviously Thomas Metzinger is working on as well he has a new book out um, um, forget the name of it now but you can google it where he 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 deals with exactly that thing is that he he proposes we need a new sort of culture of a new more conscious sort of culture you know and that includes probably a a non-dogmatic way to approach um um, spirituality so uh, but we're going to get to this whole dignity bit i think in another um in another excerpt so What we need, says Metzinger, is a new kind of ethics, an ethics of consciousness. Traditional ethics focuses on actions, but consciousness ethics would address which states of mind are desirable and why. It would consider the potential benefits of altered states, the risks involved and the broader implications for society. For example, if new technologies could enhance empathy or moral behavior, would we be obligated to use them? And how do we balance the benefits of these enhancements with the potential for misuse? Looking ahead, the intersection of neurotechnology and society will 
force us to rethink many aspects of our daily lives. Whether it's managing attention in a world flooded with distractions or grappling with new definitions of mental health and personal agency, we are moving in uncharted territory. In free societies, the ultimate goal should be to maximize individual autonomy while protecting against significant harm. This is a complex balance to strike and one that requires public debate, transparent policies and a shared understanding of what it means to live a good and meaning, meaningful life. So we have two statements um, here and here he talks about dignity, the dignity aspect. The best way to do this uh, may be by creating a consciousness culture, a flexible attitude, a general approach that whenever possible maximizes the autonomy of the individual citizen and adopts a principle of phenomen phenomenal liberty as a guideline. Many fear that through the naturalistic turn in the image of mind, we will lose our dignity. The working concepts of consciousness ethics and consciousness culture are exactly about not losing our dignity by taking it to new levels of autonomy in dealing with our conscious minds. So, I mean, I guess <laughs> this is just, it's, it's a natural development that with the onset of new technologies and the changes they evoke in our in, in the in, in the image we have of ourselves and also the way we, we we cognate you know we will have to sort of define those topics that need reflection let's put it that way uh, not sure if everything needs regulation but reflection so The consciousness revolution is here and it's changing the way we think about the mind, experiences and ethics. How we choose to navigate these changes will define the future of our society. So what kind of consciousness do we want to cultivate and who gets to decide? Let's keep this conversation going in the comments below. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on the ethics of consciousness and neurotechnology? This video concludes our coverage of the Ego Tunnel. Um, you can decide which of the three books we will review next. To cast your vote, please go down to the comment section, um, scroll down a couple of posts and you'll find the poll there. Whichever book gets the most votes by September 9th will be covered next. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, um, please don't forget to like, subscribe and hit the notification bell. And I'll see you in my next video. Bye.